Good afternoon, it's Rosemary Barlu from Art BOP and this afternoon I have with me the established Rotorua artist and writer Miriam Rabool and Miriam's going to talk to us both about her life, her community involvement and in the second half Miriam's going to talk to us about her own art practice and artwork. Good afternoon Miriam, how Hello, lovely Rosemary. to have Hello, you Rosemary. here. Day. Miriam Rebell, mm. I understand that you have had a somewhat convoluted path to your arrival in Rotorua. Well, yes, I've, um, I don't know about convoluted, but certainly steadily on the move and um, always moving forward. It feels like always moving forward. Yeah. You've lived in other places in the world and in New Zealand? Yes, started out in Germany, went to England, from there to Africa, back to England, to Venezuela, West Indies, Britain, and then got married and came to New Zealand. And since then, lots of travel to Australia and, and Europe, Canada, America, Spain. <laughs> you could be. And then within, yes, within New Zealand, I've moved roughly every two years. But Until I came here. Now located in Rotorua. Yes, and I've decided to, I'm staying, I'm pretty much. And not only do you have an arts practice that takes you around New Zealand, you're also involved in a number of community activities and community organisations both involved in the arts and not involved in the arts. Absolutely. Do you want yes. to tell us about some you of those? you want both? to know more about oh, that? Oh, yes. <laughs> well, starting with the arts, I'm involved. I'm a trustee of the Rotorua Arts Village on the board there. And I'm um, involved with, more peripherally, with things like the Children's Art House that's being... Um, is underway. Um, it's not complete, but it's well underway and very close to starting. And does have openings every now and then when there's something on, then the house opens and people can participate. What is the Children's Art House? Children's Art House was, as I understand it, um, there's, there's a national movement started by Shona Hardy Boys, I believe her name was, is... And her concept is that you you find the children or children present themselves as wanting to participate in drawing or arts or films or whatever. And so then from the children upwards, you build a place supporting them build it. So it's quite a radical departure from the usual top-down model, you know. And it's very successfully working in places like Apotiki in other parts of the country, and um, it's underway. It's and underway. it offers children a spectrum of art experience. On Well, it's it, ideally, according to the model, it'll go out from the children will say, I want to, and then that gets facilitated. Rather than this is what we're doing. doing. Um, how can you fit in? It's almost like a discovery program. Absolutely. Is it? Right. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that's an educational program in some of the schools where the children select the topics. Yes. And it comes under the general heading of discovery education. Right. Well, that'll, that, that sounds mm -hmm. right. Yes. So it's exciting. And it's in the government gardens near the new museum. So it's got plenty of space for outside things as well and um, easy to find. You know, and it's relatively safe for kids. It's not um, a lot of fast traffic or anything like that. That sounds that, – that's an initiative through the Arts Village? No, it's an, actually a council initiative um, fostered by the mayor okay. uh, who's very, very supportive of the arts activities in – in the area, not just in, in our city. And that's yes. Steve Chadwick. That's Stevie Chadwick, yes. yeah. They, yeah, she's terrific. 
so well, I've been to the Arts Village, but can you give us a word picture of the Arts Village? Well, the Arts Village, okay, so the Arts Village is a little bit down the road, actually not even a block. Well, it's two blocks on the other side of the road, but it's in the same block on the left side of the road. As the government gardens. As, as the government gardens. And if one walks around, it's all part of a complex. And so one of the um, mayor and council's visions is to have an arts precinct because the whole thing geographically, just there's nothing in between any of it, really. And um, so the arts village, I'm not very up on the blow-by-blow blow count of the um, of how it came about, but... F- Basically, it came about because um, there's some hist- historic, two historic buildings, council responsibility for those. And so two s- large studios were built in between and corridored and um, with an outside corridor to join the whole thing up. And then um, there's a studio slash gallery that leads to a little shop, which is... Um, not actually the Arts Village shop. It's um, it's a part of the premises rented by a, a group of, of crafts and arts people who operate it under, under the umbrella, if you like, of the Arts Village. And so then it's um, physically, that's basically it physically. There's a sort of a mosaic, well, not sort of, there's an actual mosaic pathway laid down by dozens of volunteers. I think something like 380,000 squares went into it. And But um, more atmospherically, it has all kinds of stuff going on, from English as a second language to um, cooking and music, and, like the Japanese drummers meet It's a there. real cultural and education centre. It is, it's, and it's, it's, our effort is... To, uh, you know, our wish is to be really community, not exactly driven, but certainly as in we sit and wait. No, we don't sit and wait, but it's it's not um, exclusive. So part of our vision is that it should be a place where anybody who wants to participate in the arts can. And if I remember rightly, there's a large tree outside there the is front a large tree. of the Arts Village and it is covered in yarn bombing. Yes. Well, some coming up for 12, it might even be two years now. Gosh, maybe it's been up all Christmas. Not long ago, <laughs> not so long ago, um, the Arts Village secured funding and um, that made it possible to... Um, empower a group of uh, mostly women where uh, this was led by Annette Bates who's a really great fibre artist um, in Rotorua and um, she and a whole bunch of others including me um, taught people, we offered to teach people to knit and crochet and then meanwhile the idea was producing the miles and miles of stuff that was needed and people got in behind that. And it's still going on. I just took a photo yesterday of, um, do you know the three car figures at the entrance to the ro- to the um, Redwood Forest? No. Okay. Oh, well, like, they've been yarn bombed. They've been yarn bombed. <laughs> and all around town, you did, like there's another, mm. suddenly there's a rhododendron tree in, in the city, in the, right, right in the city, two whole blocks away, uh, which has been yarn bombed. And... Um, it's, they're popping up, you know, like on the backs of benches. I'm, you don't really see it all because I'm driving, but um, it does hit your eye every now and then. So it's been a huge attraction. And um, Well, yes, because the day that we were there, there, there were just hordes of tourists photographing the tree. It's uh, their, their eye catches. Yeah, yeah, um, which was the plan. The plan was to draw more attention to... The fact that this is here and, um, and that there's something inside of interest. There's always an exhibition or on of at least one, if not more, artists or group exhibitions. So they've had the sculpture symposium um, that Mark Spikerbosch um, instigated and saw through. 
And those and sculptures that, are sitting yes, there now. And that created the sculpture trail in the government gardens, yeah, didn't it? Yeah. Yes. So it's all happening. Does the Arts Village have its own Facebook page? It does. Yes, it does. It has its own Facebook page. It has a website. I can't quote the exact numbers for them now, but um, yeah, they're operating. Cool. It has um, a monthly market. We have a monthly market where things, um, the clear structure on what you can sell there, and it's things that have been made in New Zealand um, and been, well, made, not just bought, and like socks, say, you know, Machine-made socks from China do not appear there. So it's a great place for lots of... Original art and craft. Original art and craft, yes. And some very good food sometimes. Mm. Now, not only the arts, I understand, you have uh, participated in other community-based activities there. I think, yes, I do. (laughs) I I think it's fun and I I feel my Mm. part of my place in the world, how I pay my rent on the planet, is to be helpful. I think that's what's, what's required of me. And so, and also, um, it's just interesting. So when I moved, for example, I moved to Rotorua, um, I renovated a house and had the same builder for like eight months around. And he's a collector and a rock hound. And why didn't I come and meet some people? And so I originally went to the rock club because I thought, well, being totally selfish, of course, as you know, as I tend to be, um, went along thinking, well, this will be great outings to see the area. And the first outing was up to the Coromandel and um, unbelievably boring terrain where we went. <laughs> Nothing that Don't I... listen, world. The Coromandel's beautiful. Oh yes, but this, this <laughs> was this like bit. this was down like a, in a mm. ditch. You know, mm. rock hounds aren't yes. there for the beauty. They're no, there for the, for the rocks, for the the mm. rivers and the 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 banks and the landslides. And all the trees were broken. You know, and it was not what I like to draw. But I started collecting, and it was really hot, so I got on the river and started collecting car- carnelian. It's very easy to identify. Yes. And started, pl- and I was, I'm hooked, I'm hooked. So now I go just to go and find rocks. And, are you uh, a little rock collector? I'm a little rock collector now. These are such nice people, and uh, it's part of what I like about the Rotorua area is is the, the the thoroughly decency, you know, the thorough decency of people. And for the seven years I've been there, they never change. You know, it's not, and that's not a not a criticism. They're just solid. I know what I need to do. This is how it goes, dum dum dum, and they're all, of course, historians or geologists. So the other club I belong to now is the Collectors Club. Even though I actually don't collect anything much now, because I'm, you know, downsizing like many people my age. But they're great. They're very interesting. They know so much about so much. And you know? is the Collectors Club uh, like that they 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 be collecting? Um, what kind of thing? Oh, look, it ranges from teapots. You know, somebody collects teapots, somebody else collects jugs, somebody collects war paraphernalia. Um, there's a man who's got an amazing collection of measuring instruments, of all, you know, from scales to rulers to things that you drop, you know, and stuff like that. Um, there are people who collect dolls. And China, and um, man, there's a man that collects um, horse rig, you know, um, mm. but draw horse regalia, the old brass things and things like that. One man collects African uh, tribal art. Yes, yeah, so it's a you know it's a good night. Very nice people, and um, yeah. And you're doing that as well as participating in the general arts community in Rotorua? Participating, yes. It's, there isn't really, it's interesting, you know, what that would mean. Um, I'm, I'm involved with the, um, I'm a member of the um, New Zealand Fine Arts Academy and the Artists Alliance, and so through that, those two, one has some links. I have friends who are artists, but not only because I feel it's useful to be grounded in everyday life 
not just in the you know the heights of creativity, which can be can get a bit abstract. At the best, it, certainly my work can, and um, so I've involved my I'm involved now in the city council's positive aging. That's what I was working round to without yes. asking you directly. I want you to tell us what that is about. It's a new body that has been established by council to um, help ensure by running things, as this is what I understand from my job description, that um, they will run things um, of that ideas of theirs and ideas that are put to them and programs and requests through this group of, I believe we're 10, um, with a view to achieving their 2030 um, positive ageing strategy, and which links into the annual, you know, the, the, the long-term plan. And this is, this is part of making an enriched community for, with an aged focus? Well, an, an enriched community, but um, in my view, I'm looking for, um, and I think, you know, one of the interesting, it's a really interesting group, very dynamic and positive and looking for coming from different fields of experience. So my interest is in terms of access, ease of access, not just physical access, but to information and to the means and that really not too much concrete should be put in place at this point for people who will be aged um, in 10 years' time. What one needs is uh, the ability to respond because I think we have no idea what it's going to be like in 10 years' time. Things are shifting so fast. Or what they're going to need, whoever they are, you mm -hmm. know. And that when does this actually start? So trying to do physical, purely physical things, okay, so that has to be on a, I think, on a personal demand need basis. But creating this atmosphere of welcome and participation and, and precisely, oh, no, we're not going to, I hope, have a corner where... Old people, that's where you're welcome. There's mm, your place. No, no, that would not. You know, that would not suit either you or I. <laughs> it wouldn't suit us, would it? No. And I don't think it wouldn't suit anybody I know. And that would be with pe nobody at forty wants to be told that's your department. So part of that is an interesting move. Is the um, have you heard about the the plans to for the DHB the hospital board to have a child health unit in, in, built into the library. Yes. Yes. So, see, I'm not directly involved in that, but I am, we're having... A I thought that was, it, that I, excuse me interrupting you, that was initially the start, wasn't it, because there were issues about the building, the... Exactly. It needs a lot of, um, as I understand, it needs a lot of reinforcing. But the, the, the fundamental concept is taking the service to where... Yes. People feel comfortable going. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's a really exciting concept. I do too. And um, having seen in the initial plans, we've had a present, part the positive aging group has had. See, I get to be really nosy, I think, because I'm going to sit in one chair and have all the stuff that's going on, or a lot of the stuff that's going on will, will come through because of the group. The all-encompassing thing, really, that it, really ageing people are just people and they're ratepayers and they live in the community, so we need to know what they think. I'm involved in U3A, the University of the Third yes. Age, which many of your listeners will, um, will belong to as well. It's very strong over here. I think it has something about like 700 members in Tauranga Township. I don't know about out here at the Mount. We've got about 300 members. And for anyone who doesn't know, that's an ongoing, mature adult from learning 55, experience. From 55, yes, from 55. But I think they'd let you in at 48 if you, you know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not in charge. <laughs> the, and just on the um, council aspect, I understand from talking to you that your council has created some gallery space within the council. Yes, the Galleria. Well, you know, the, in the old council buildings model, there's always like this hallowed hall with the portraits of past mayors if you, or somebody, you know, or benefactors. And we had that. Important people. 
once important people. <laughs> once important people. Not to refer to them as has-beens, but, you know, people who were once <laughs> important and might not be so important now. And um, in our case, really out of step, these large um, portrait photos were really out of step with the rest of the um, appointment of the building, which has a lot of carving, it has art, it has fabulous Japanese ceramic vases that have been gifted, all sorts of things like that. And then they hang these things. And so it really came from the idea of, again, Stevie Chadwick and um, and her chief executive um, have sort of built this organically, not with total support of their council members, um, to get these portraits put somewhere else, paint the walls white, and have regular exhibitions of local Rotorua artists' work going on. So there's one there currently with um, with my wonderful... I just love it, actually, to see it all out, to see um, ten paintings with the local red ochre that I've collected and um, turned to work. So one's a series of five and the other's a series so of five. So you're the featured artist in the council Well, I'm gallery. just a multiple artist. So I've got I've got ten works there. And um, then there's Debbie Tyne, who's a spectacular artist from the Polytech, and Michael State, and Michael Smith has got um, a lovely work that acknowledges his relationship with his partner. So it's, yeah, and so and the next one will actually be celebrating Chinese New Year. So that goes up mid September. We and come down, and mid September there'll be something relating to that. They're obviously open to the public. Yes, in council hours. But it's a free, open... Free, day. open. So you go up these wonderful stairs, you walk past this big um, carving in a glass sort of patio, and then and then they, and off to these are all the council rooms, and then there's the chamber at the end where all the important stuff happens. And you, so you're walking past all this, past um, the art. There are actually also our Liz Pierce's dolls. Oh, yes. There are four of her dolls on display, which is just amazing. You, uh, one of the things we didn't mention is that you have recently become, in quotes, our Rotorua correspondent for Art BOP. A great blessing, yes. yes. And Liz Pierce's dolls, her heartfelt dolls... And they are very unusual. And very heartfelt, yes. yes. They formed the basis of an article you have on Art BOP. Mm. Yes. Um, Rotorua itself, Miriam, has undergone, I'd have to say, well, in a Rotorua, they've got some quite dramatic improvements going on, creativity and public art-wise. Mm. Yes. Well, from when does one want to start? I first went to Rotorua in the late 60s. I've been, had a, actually a lot to do with the town over the, my, over the years that I've lived in New Zealand. And, um, you know, in those days you went to the Blue Lake and you stayed in the caravan park. And I don't think I ever walked around the lake then. And I don't think anybody else did, you know. Or nobody I knew did. And, and the kids played in the lake and fish and chips for tea. And now there's, you know, all these Nike-clad people with their time on their shoulder and charging around. And Yes, I think a huge effort's been put in. Um, and certainly my experience is that um, the constant flow of tourists with, with, with varying agenda, so there's the sort of the winter sports and then there's the summer sports and the fact that we have the... Um, such good um, mountain biking facilities. And you can fish and sail and, you know, walk and swim and boat. And, I mean, what else does... You know, for the average family still that wants to have give their children in particular or even just their parents a pleasant time and a, rel and a pretty safe time, it's a great place to be. And, of course, there's a lot of music. And, but I think it's the tourists that bring bring that slightly up atmosphere, you know, this expectation of fun, and um, that helps ignite us locally, I think. 
And in terms of igniting, they've they've done a lot of work in the centre of Rotorua, haven't they? And it's not finished, yeah. So we have the new cycleway. We, we've got the green corridor um, coming up for completion. Um, areas have been designated for the Eat Street, um, and which goes straight through to the lake. And um, Eat Street. Yeah, and of course we have Thursday Night Market. We have the Thursday oh, night yes, market they, with all the wonderful food. Yes, the night market. Yeah, so that starts at about five. So mostly food, you know. So it's either food to buy or take and take away, and um, and people come in with real boutique cheeses and wines and oils and breads and oh, and then there's just all the stuff that you can eat there. <laughs> the just before we close this first section of, of our conversation, Miriam, you're also, I think, involved in activities around the museum in some way, aren't you? That's an arts focus. The Rotorua Museum's not just a museum. It's got a lot of art exhibition and, and um, creative and music activities. Yes, well, uh, the music activity we could thank Karen Vincent for. The rogue, the rogue stage. Yes. She, um, and the, obviously I didn't organise it, so I don't know the background to it, but I, what happened, you know, the result is that on that the um, the cafe had an advance menu available, so ordering platters and things, and um, a whole string of musicians appeared in the cafe, about three of them, and the museum cleared out its entire foyer for that first music in the museum, but there are going to be more. They have have, have promised us more. So it's a new collaboration. Probably happened before. From what I hear, there's been music in there before. But present time, Karen Vincent is doing it. You've written about that too, haven't you? I have, because (laughs) I think it's my job to let people know. (laughs) What the fabulous things happening in Rotorua. We've uh, published that online We've had we had a spot of difficulty getting the image to go in with it, but we've achieved that now. So anyone wanting to see what's been happening and read yes. about what you've seen in the well, what's been playing at the Rotorua Museum, and they can find the museum, the Rotorua Museum, and and the Rogue Stage on Facebook. Good. And, yeah, they. Well, we'll come back and in part two of our conversation with Miriam Rebeur, we're going to talk about Miriam's personal art practice and style and her art teaching practice. Hi, my name is Paul and I am Paul Ullerman Fine Art Photography. I specialise in a number of different photographic genres, um, long exposure landscapes, more regular landscapes, digital infrared, and high-speed liquid photography. Please feel free to check out my work. You can find me at www.paulolamanphotography.com and on Facebook, search for Paul Ullerman Photography. Thanks. Hello, we're back again for part two of our conversation with Miriam Rebeul, the artist and art teacher and art BOP correspondent from Rotorua. Well, Miriam, now we're going to ask you about your own personal art practice. Right. And I have to say that I first saw your work, I think, in the either the gallery at Creative Tauranga, where there were large swirls of this these just fabulous, dynamic, abstract, orangey-red swirls. I've also seen work of yours in exhibitions of the Tauranga Society of Artists. Mm, yes, I'm a member of both. Mm-hmm. And um, I met you quite a while ago, didn't I, now? Mm. So I, I've been working, the red swirls are red ochre or red oxide. And um, I, it's been a surprise to me because I was painting in, Oh, I don't really paint, you know, I experiment. But because the motion is like this, it's an applying something to something else. It tends to get called painting. And um, the red ochre came about partly because when I got to Rotorua, I thought, well, now what? 
you know. What do you do now? Well, you get to know what's going on here. What are people made of? What's the, what is this place about? And I started reading the history and didn't really come across any references to, in fact, I didn't come across any references to red ochre or pigments or paint. And But I started, was driving around and I started seeing these patches. And um, I thought, huh. Oh. What's going on here, you know? Took some home and being, I guess, you know, how you're brought up, you wash everything, you, you know? You, you try and analyse something, you wash it to see what's really in there. And so over time I d I've developed a method of cleaning this um, red oxide, keeping the very fine particles, which are like a clay level, clay being the size of the particle, and um, painting with that, so spreading that on in various ways. And um, that's Oca, what you could... Ochre is actually a form of soil, isn't it? It what is the soil. It is. It is soil. But ours is really... I mean, red ochre, the earliest m recorded history of it being mined, never mind used, is in Africa 40,000 years ago. It's the most common pigment around the world and through the ages. And so even in the, those French caves, you will see the red mark. That will be red ochre. And the, the black's probably from the wood, you know, the fires. But um, it's the red that's so interesting. And um, ours, a lot of clay is formed by erosion. And so you find it in sort of bands maybe. Or ours is geothermally altered rocks. Right, so I'm basically painting with melted rocks. I think that's terribly exciting. Living in, living in a volcanic area, you know, so I'm very aware of those 3,000 or so little earthquakes we get every year and the, uh, the fact that every day you get up and your pictures are not straight anymore. So you know something happened during the night. You know. I have that. You, you have that? <laughs> yes. Right, well... <laughs> Ours mm. is due to volcanoes. What's yours due to? I'm hoping it's due to volcanoes. Not lurching <laughs> around the room. I don't think so. <laughs> it normally happens after I've gone to bed. After you've gone to mm. bed, yes. Well, this is, the, yeah, how is that, you know? How come they hang straight all day and then you get up in the morning, they're not straight anymore? Well, I prefer the earthquake to the pixies theory. Yes. Okay, mm. the night pixies. Yeah, so that set me off on this thing. And. Part of, um, I've worked with other materials. I'm, if I, w I do a lot of texture work, I'm interested in textures. I'm interested actually in the materials and in the processes. As much as the result. And that the, the, the result is really that conversation. So you put one or two materials onto a substrate and the three, if there's three, so th I count that as one, the substrate is one. Then the three, and then you add water, so there's four. You've already got four variables, right? But it's quite enough with two, with the red ochre, well, three, water and um, and the substrate. And then the result is just that conversation that's taken place there. Some of the works that I've seen that you have used the ochre, as I said, the first collection or exhibition mm. I saw it was the ochre on their own yes on its own rather mm. but you actually use it in conjunction with a heavy black as well ah, I think. Yes. yes yeah so the first ones you saw were, were not the first ones I did but I suddenly I was starting on a series in um, I was in at the beginning of a series and I like series because you have your canvas is spread out and then Boom, you're off, right? You sort of pop through this little hole and and you're there. You Miriam in Wonderland. Wonderland, Happyville, yeah. you know? And it's actually a huge sense of freedom. And so I was, but I had um, sort of planned what the next one was supposed to be in a much denser form. I had an idea, oh, well, I've, now I've got to do this and da da da. Doesn't work for me. So I started out. And I suddenly realised this great change, you know, that 
the glow from the ochre comes from less, not from more. Whereas I had been trying to put it on more smoothly and more evenly. A bit like paint on a car, actually, when I look back, you know. Nah, not what you need. So that's you saw the result of that aha uh -huh moment. Yes, because the... I don't know how, what kind of brush you used. It looked like a great big paintbrush, but you got different levels of texture and colour and swirls all in one huge sweeping motion. That's right. Well, the, the brush, you can come and meet the brush. The brush, I have Chinese brushes, among others. I mean, I'm just as likely to use a, a, a squeegee bob. It's, that's it. It's simply like... Without having an end in mind, like not trying to reproduce something realistically or teach you something or illustrate something, you know, or fake some reality thing, um, it's, okay, what happens when? What if? That's what's going on my grave. What if? You know? What if? That's the big question. Instead of that dash in the middle, you know, you started and you finished and then there's the dash in the middle. Well, in the middle is going, what if? And um, so it might be a squeegee, but I've done a number of wax of workshops with Max Gimblet and um, no small brushes in sight. And I happened upon in Wellington, his, the shop, the Chinese... Um, I'd call it a medicine shop, but it probably isn't. But it looks, you know, it's got all sorts of herbs and things and fabulous looking bottles and lots of blue little bits of china. And oh, like Wally's oh, in Auckland. you know, it's just Bloody. wonderful. Max Gimlet buys his brushes from this shop. And there was a picture of him in the window, which caught my eye. And so and there are brushes there as tall as you, you know. So they're on the floor stuff on big sheets of paper. So I've done some workshops with him. So that it, it straight away takes you away from all kinds of carefulness. F not focus, but from carefulness. And I've done a lot of training with Stan Chan, um, master calligrapher in Wellington, which again is in Chinese ink and Chinese brushes. And um, did learn a little bit about um, how to paint flowers and, you know, the, the, the four, four treasures, the form... Um, treasures yeah orchids chrysanthemums blossom and orchids chrysanthemums blossoms and bamboo how can i miss bamboo <laughs> i've done miles of bamboo. <laughs> bamboo miles of bamboo bamboo is the only one that really interests me mm. it's just the most fabulous thing to paint but because it's because it's in the stroke it's not in just the finish, it's about the focus you bring to that sheet of paper and to that ink and you've ground your ink yourself and it is a, a wonderfully intense but not totally stable black. So whereas Indian ink is, boom, that's it. Is it Indian ink you used in no, conjunction? No, no, I used oh. Chinese ink in and what you saw was Chinese ink. Oh. And it's because... Because it's, it's black, black. It's black, black. Um, I had a bit of a downturn when I discovered that a Chinese emperor had banned the use of charcoal to making ink because China would run out of forests, which at the time I thought sounded a bit ridiculous. But I've since flown over China and realised... He was right. He was right. He was onto something. So my understanding is that modern Chinese ink is made from petroleum by, as a petroleum mm. byproduct, right? I was very sad about that because I had this idea I was using all natural, natural products, yeah. you know. And I thought, well, well, I'm still going to use it. And partly because it's, it so easily tells its own story. So it, it looks black and easy, look, but mixed with other things. So in the pop-up that you didn't get to see. We won't go And I there. think they're all sold now. They're all gone. <laughs> that was um, an issue of parking. That was your parking mm. issue, yes. Well, where the ink meets the red ochre meets the diatomite that I use from mm -hmm. north of um, the northern part of the lake, which is interesting in itself, suddenly, 
and unpredictably it will produce an eggshell blue. It's, it's absolutely spellbinding. Spellbinding. Because you don't know it's going to happen. You hope it will. Do you know what makes it happen? I have no idea. It's simply, all I can, it's something about water plus ink plus red ochre plus diatomite. Diatomite is a fossilized mm. algae, two celled thing that you can see under your microscope. And where those three components mix, for reasons unknown to me, suddenly there'll be this little patch of blue exactly where you could do with one, roughly the color of my ring, you know. But not everywhere it happens, you know, no. not everywhere. No, so. Random. Randomly, serendipitously, yes. So each of your works, apart from being abstract, is unique because you don't control all of the process. No, I don't, I don't predestine. The, the, you know, I control in the sense that I select the canvas, um, I get them made at Tangies, so I select the surface. Oh, now that's, excuse me interrupting you, Miriam, that's something that fascinated me, was that you have all your canvases made. Mm. You don't use stock. No. Because? Well, because I've, you know, you have these lucky little um, incidents in your life. And, um, well, in your art life even. So, oh, you know, it's very tempting to go to one of the big outlets and buy 60% uh, off this, that, and the other. But what, what I started to find was, and when I started out, I did exactly that, you know, exactly that. And then things happen, like I went into a framer here in Tauranga that no longer exists, and he was dealing with two things. One, a painting that had been sold um, through them that had warped, the... the um, supports had twisted and it was like we're talking thousands not a couple of hundred or something and another one where the can canvas had simply split up the middle so um, I take note you know and I study and read a lot and it's and it makes such a difference to um, how you approach it it's about respect you know it's like not just respect for the consumer at the other end who eventually needs to know that um, if people like it enough that they'll be passing this on through the generations. If they don't like it, it goes to the op shop. Well, your name is still on it. So what do you want people to say about the quality of your tools? And um, my mother was a weaver. She wove prayer shawls that went all over the world. And she would, I can hear her just, no, nah, she had to have the best gold thread. Not because she was vain, but because people should get the best. You know, people need, I think, need to get the best you can manage. And if that means you paint a little less, well, I think you paint a little less myself. Or you paint on something else and then don't offer that for sale. By the time it comes up for being offered for sale and purchase, then quality control is very important to me. And so I get, uh, I have um, Steve at Tangie's, does canvas stretching and he has some very good lines of canvas. I get a particular stretch so that the bars, the supports can be taken out and they can be rolled and posted um, overseas. And the most recent one's going to Hong Kong. So new territory, I'm delighted about that. Where was that purchased from? That was purchased online. Oh, isn't that I know, it's, it's exciting. Because you did tell me a little anecdote that one of your paintings hangs in conjunction with a macan. It does. I can't give the address. No, no. <laughs> but it's actually not terribly far away. Right. You know, and it's, it's in the same room as a macan. And I think, oh, I like that, you know. I know it sounds vain, but it's the truth. No, I don't think it sounds vain. I think what you're saying is... What I have been saying about the Bay of Plenty, that the creativity here is amazing. Oh, it's huge. And we offer people within the Bay of Plenty a very diverse and wonderful creative experience. Just being a bit commercial, where was the website that they found your work? Oh, right. The website that I I have my own website, and that works well. The other one I use is the 
New Zealand Art Show website. And um, so NZ Art Show, probably .com. No, actually it's .co.nz, but that's easily found. And um, you manage your own pages. You pay your monthly rate. You handle your sales yourself. And I like that because in my experience, my kind of art, people want to link with the artist. They don't just want a trophy, you know. They would that's be not getting... a put. That's not meant to be a put down. It's simply no. the, the connection is the bit that matters. So they like dealing mm. with the artist. And most people um, that have bought my work, it's been like that. And I can understand that because the... Um, abstract soil painting series that I saw in Creative Tauranga, they were so energised and I said to the people in Creative Tauranga at the time, if I could I'd buy all of these and take, they, I think that might even have been before I met you, mm. I'd buy all of these and take them home because they just made me feel so good. Mm. So I understand why people would want the personal connection and that's really it's, it's important it's lovely to hear that because I want people to feel good you know I want them to have a good experience I want them to feel uplifted somehow not um not I'm not against dragged down but not um I don't want them to feel insulted that's the thing you know that they took the time to come and have a look I mean there's there's like even just on Etsy you know Etsy whatever it's called Etsy 1.5 million pieces of art for sale through 36 or 38,000 suppliers. You know? It's a lifetime so, looking. So it's a lifetime looking. And how do you weed through all that? And so the only, you know, I would take the course of, well, okay, so ah, let's go and see. Let's go and see. Let's go and meet, you know. So that's how my sales tend to happen. The online ones have been a couple of just really anonymous online sales. Well, I've seen this. Is it still available? Yes, here's the money. Boom, off, right? End of story. But it's unusual. It's still nice. It's still nice. See, I think for, for me, there's no longer, it's no longer necessary to put your, hat, your creative life in the hands of galleries, speaking really generally, right? Um, in the hands of galleries and um, in the hands of upmarket, um, well, upmarket, I can't think of the English word for this that's polite, but the, the sort of mainstream um, master's level art schools, right? You don't have to do that anymore. In the, it, I believe that's a gatekeeping system. It puts more people off than it encourages and um, you're in massive competition, whereas my experience is you, the question is, do you back yourself? Do you enjoy what you do? Are you willing to share that? Do you want somebody else to have some pleasure from what you've done? And then now, which is all new, not new, but unexpected in a sense, I didn't set out to be a commercially viable artist. But I sold my first painting through the Art Society. And then it was all on. I thought, right, let's see what else we can do. And having a background in helping people start their own business and um, earn their incomes, that's always interested me. I, part of what I help people with is how do you get out there? What are you doing? You know, What do you actually want to do and who do you want to reach? Things like that. And you actually do reach people because you actually have an arts teaching practice. Yes. Tell us all about that. Well, I don't have, um, what do I do? I don't have, tell you what I don't have. <laughs> my focus is my own art mm -hmm. um, when I'm painting, you know, when I'm doing that. At the moment, I'm in a research phase and experimenting with some ideas. And um, I'm unlikely to show any more work probably for a year as I see it. And so in that time, I really like teaching. In, and, I, and it actually isn't teaching. It's just a little nudge here and up there. And uh, I supply a bunch of materials and get people to bring some stuff. And then we, well, then well, we have some the conversations. What that you supply? Oh, well. Well, coming up, um, formally coming up, I'm doing a brush-making 
workshop at the Arts Village in the middle of October. And then I'm doing brush making and, uh, and some texture, making some textures. And um, then in November, I'm teaching every weekend in at the art school in Taupo. Taupo, so art school Taupo on Facebook. Um, doing workshops there, making your own brushes, because that means you can make your own marks. You know, so yes, yeah, so I've got. They're going to learn to make all kinds of brushes with all kinds of stuff, and making textures with various you know, commercial products available, that are um, that each have a desired effect. And if you get technique good at good at that, you get that result. Uh, but it's not the only way. So that means there are about three ways. Well, there are cheaper ways and more versatile ways, and so having a texture workshop and um, mixed media. So I do a lot of stuff with inks and um, thinking about, I'm, I'm not thinking, I've decided to have a workshop where people paint with the soil from their own garden. Use that to me. How, does that appeal to you? Would, would that appeal to you if you were going to do something like that? Having seen the results you've got with the ochre, I can imagine that it would be the same kind of experience you have when you are allowed to play with the Play-Doh at the play centre. Ah, yes. You don't realise how freeing it is. And free, you know, freedom, that's the key word, I think, mm. is that to free yourself. My arts journey has really been a freeing up, a unlearning uh, saying yes all very interesting and we learn from the people who've gone before and we don't have to standing on their shoulders doesn't mean doing more of what they do better or anything like that it's about finding your own authentic joy what gives you joy you know and you don't always find that straight away. It's like everything else. It takes not everything you do for the first time, you do very well. I can think of a few things, you know, like my first attempt at winning a swimming race, you know. I didn't win. Well, that's it. I was out of there, you know. I wish I'd persisted. In a, I hadn't learned about persistence. Part of traveling a lot is you don't have to persist with anything. It's my excuse. But um, to get back to that, that... Authentic art is what, or even just creativity, what, if you don't want to call it art, you call it creativity. The impulse to add and to make new and to express and somehow expand, I think everybody's got that. Not everyone has the opportunity. I, you know, I see that. But we, obviously more people do have that now than at any previous time, given the number of people who are willing to call themselves artists of some ilk so my banner is no more secondhand art that's what I'm about and getting people um, particularly you know people have heard of notions of body mind connections and they, the people have ideas about this and they want to build community and they're actually all organic processes that happen in nature just as they happen in your body so there's a view of your body that says you're actually just a walking collection of colonies of cells going about their own business perfectly <laughs> efficiently. You mean we're wasting all this money on clothing? They're all little colonies. To keep our little colonies warm, you know. It's, it's almost like the ozone layer, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so that's it. And so then the other course I'm doing is... Um, Building your own business practice. Being uh, my courses used to be called Passionate Pursuits, and so using that material um, in the arts um, arena and or that kind of approach to everybody can make a living from what they produce creatively, if they have the desire to do so. That's my belief. Well, I think that we have been very lucky in the Bay of Plenty that you decided that you would stay here because seven years sounds a long time after your travels. It does. It is. It is. It is. So Miriam Rebeul, artist and writer of Rotorua, member of the Rotorua 
what is the group called when in, in the aging group? Positive aging. Member of the positive aging group, arts teacher. And I hope the person who is going to go with Mark Spikerbosch and take Art BOP through the wonderful Rotorua Happy to do that. Sculpture yes. Trail. Thank you for coming to talk with Art BOP this afternoon. I'm oh, delighted. Thank you for the opportunity. And we're going to look forward to a series of articles from you about Rotorua because it sounds as though there's an awful lot going on over well, there. Well, the next one, look out for the <laughs> next one Te Amorangi Trust Museum. Yes. Complete treasure trust. Are all of the things you write about available to the public? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there you go. A conversation with Miriam Raboul.